acknowledge the valuable presence of the dignitaries, deans and associate deans, staff and students for this Power Talk session. All that begins well, ends well. I call upon Swarna Lakshmi to lead us in prayer. Kindly stand for the invocation song. Maitrim bhajata akilah jaitri Maitrim bhajata akilah jaitri Maitrim bhajata akilah jaitri Atma vadev parar pipashat Atma vadev parar pipashat Yuddham tyajatat, spardham tyajatat, yuddham tyajatat, spardham tyajatat, tyajata pareshva krama makramanam, tyajata pareshva krama makramanam, maitrim bhajata akilah jaitrim. Janani Prithvi Kamadugaste Janani Prithvi Kamadugaste Janako Devaha Sakaladayalu Janako Devaha Sakaladayalu Damyata Dhatta Dayadvam Janata Damyata Dhatta Dhyadvam janatan Shreyo bhoyat sakala jananam 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 The promo video of Daksh 17 will now be played. Traditional Indian art forms find favor even in this age of information, and the longevity of such practices have been attributed much to its exponents. They make sure that our rich tradition is passed on to future generations without being lost in the wilderness. One such art form, Kada Kalak Shepam, an Indian form of religious storytelling, involves the recital of Hindu religious texts such as the Puranas, Ramayana, or Bhagavata Purana, and is often followed by a commentary or pravarchan. This practice of storytelling enjoyed its golden period in many Indian states between the years 1870 and 1940. Till this day, this practice has been continuing with positive reception from audience, and there are many profound speakers who carry forward the rich legacy of their ancestors. A torchbearer of this art form is present before us today. A prominent Carnatic vocalist and an established Harikatha artist, please welcome Srimati Vishaka Hari. <laughs> Mrs. Vishaka Hari received formal training in Carnatic music under the legendary Padma Vibhushan awardee, Sri Lalgudi Jayaraman. While her spiritual guru and father-in-law is Sri Sri Krishna Premi Swamigal, her Harikatha mentor is her husband, Sri Hariji, an experienced Harikatha exponent who delivers discourses in Tamil, English, and Hindi. A Bhardhanatyam proponent and with Professor Sudharani Raghupati as her guru, speaks of her proverbs in this art form. An artist by passion and a rank holder in chartered accountancy, 
Mrs. Vishaka Hari's recitals draw innumerable music lovers to her concerts, whether in India or across the seas. Her recitals center on topics like Srimad Ramayanam, Sri Vaishnava Samhita, Divya Desa Vaibhavam, Harikatam Ritta Lahari, Sri Bhakta Purisa Stavanam, and Kirtanas. Her eloquence in delivering discourses is unmatched, and this is a trait that has made her a class apart. She is a recipient of many awards like Haritvata Chudamani, Yuvakala Bharati, Tyaharaja Praditwani, and recently she was one among the seven women who were awarded during the Dr. M. S. Subalakshmi Centenary Celebrations. <laughs> I request Dr. B. Shanti, Assistant Professor Training in Placement, to honor our special speaker, Mrs. Vishaka Hari. Sastra University and Daksh are privileged to have your presence felt, and we, the audience, are all ears to listen to your lecture on the topic Super Bharat, Superpower Bharat, a rediscovery. The stage is all yours, ma'am. Thank you. At the outset, I'm very, very happy to be here and be a part of Daksh Power Talks again. The topic for today's discussion, as she said rightly, is Superpower Bharat, a rediscovery. From the introduction that she gave about me, you all would have very well understood that I have nothing to do with history. All the time I've been singing and doing Harikatha. But Harikatha, nevertheless, is just not the Katha of the Lord. It has a lot of connect with ancient India lot of connect with our nation, how glorious it was, what a glorious past we had. So, basically I would like to start with, uh, I've always met students, been with students, and uh, any time a history teacher enters the class, the first word, oh, history class, ah, Sariyana Bor. This is the first word that, to admit frankly, I would be among the students too, who would always say, history is such a bore. I was never interested in history in my teens. So I would just wonder, why do we have a subject called history at all? Why do we, why do we need to know the history of a nation? Past is past. History is history. Why do we need to worry about history and dig all the unwanted material when we have lots to worry about the future? So why think of the past? This has always been lingering in my mind. So I, I never used to be interested in history. And history, just warm it, learn whatever the history text says, just warm it, forget. This was what history meant to me in my teens and even in my late twenties. But then I was presented with a wonderful book by my revered guru, Sri Krishna Premya Swamigal. It was titled Adhyatma Bharatam. Uh, it is in Tamil. Of course, it has translations in English by many authors. It means spiritually inclined India. He presented it to me and he said, it's a history book. It was a jolt for me. History book, you library. But as a mark of respect, at least the first few pages, let me glance and flip through. So the first line that read the first question in this book it read it was like my it was like mind reading you know the mind just as if it was mind reading first question said why do you need to know history what if a student does not know history what do you gain by knowing your nation's history and what do you lose by not knowing your nation's history and then i was re really interested you know all these years i've been I've been having this question in my mind. Why do we need to know history? history is a subject. Oh, So just we, we need it for a change so that we can refresh. 
before the maths class or the science class. And I was thinking all the while. But then I read the answers that he had given, beautiful answers. It began this way. Past is not past. You need your past to decipher your future. History always repeats itself. If you don't know that India was invaded by the Mughals, India had colonial empires, it had so many incursions and invasions in the past. What would you do if in the future this repeats itself? If you don't know the past, you will not be able to handle the future. You need to know the past, what happened to India, who invaded us, what was the cause, how we faced it, why we lost, why we were subject to such misery, why we fell, and how we were at the topmost position almost through 1,700 years of recorded history. India had been an unacknowledged ancient power. So this whole lecture is going to be from this book, Adhyatma Bharata, and a very beautiful book, Ancient India, the Unacknowledged Superpower, yet to be published. The author is Narendran Tilastanam, Sri T.S. Narendran, who has come along with me. Incidentally, he is my cousin. He, is, he has an MS from Boston University and MBA from UK, Berkeley University, from Warwick University, UK, and uh, Boston, U US. Both MS and MBA, after having uh, got all these degrees and after having worked for uh, so many years in the US, he has now decided to contribute his own, the whole of his time towards writing true Indian history. It is what uh, when my revered guru gave this to me, he said, it is unmayana history. True Indian history. I never understood the word, what true Indian history meant that time. Because I thought all the history that I had read in my fourth standard, fifth standard, sixth standard, seventh standard was always true. That's what you think when you're given something and that too by the central government, NCERT, Salabis Kurtana, that is gospel for us. But then, after reading through all these books, I was taken aback because all these while, whatever history has been provided to us in our syllabus is totally falsified, totally manipulated. Padicha history alla marakono. Because everything is history in repair, we have been given fiction. And mythology in repair, facts alla marajaj. It has been undone. The whole thing we have to relearn. See, learning is easy. Relearning, redoing, undoing is very difficult. Because once you have a concept in mind, it's very difficult to get into your mind. But there are so many evidences, historical evidences, to prove that, one, whatever history we have been given right now, in the Indian education system, in the form of modern education system, whatever history we have read is falsified, British-induced, British-engineered history. Two, so what is the true history? So how was our nation in the past? How was India? Number one, India was a really very poor country, really totally miserly state impoverished state from British where they were saviors for us because of the colonial empire we grew and grew and grew and now what we are we owe everything to the westerners no absolutely ulta is what we need to know right now so there is so much evidence and the, uh, by evidence what I mean is historical evidence no, it's not just ni tondi tondi excavation lavardo ila stone and copper inscriptions are not just the evidences Every stone, Tanjavur le irukkare, kallu madakondo onakor evidence, historical evidence. Oru thoon madakondo onakor evidence. Oru severu, even a wall is an evidence in India. So the evidence comes from temples, cave temples, sculptures, buildings, palaces, mansions, forts, fortresses, paintings, coins, literature, more important, literature. What was the literature? 
what does the literature in those years tell us about our ancient india ancient india had been an unacknowledged superpower for almost 1700 years of recorded history therinje india superpower 1700 years ki irundirukku and circumstantial evidence proves that for several millennia before india was a superpower now as soon as i say superpower what is the definition of the superpower that comes to your mind superpower na if you google the term the wikipedia will say superpower is the nation's capacity to project its dominance and influence over some other nation it can be sometimes in more than one region of the globe so ipo superpower britain na solanona britain must be able to influence project its dominance and influence over anybody else anywhere else any other nation somewhere in the globe even at nook and corner of the globe but these books reconsider the definition of superpower superpower need not necessarily mean military hegemony otho vande conquer panni and the civilization alch raise down panni ellathiyum alch na superpower aagano na that superpower is not a benign superpower india conquered and dominated this is a quote from hu shi former ambassador of china to usa i'm quoting his words hu shi hu shi le hu shi chinese name former ambassador of china to usa he says india conquered and dominated china culturally for 20 centuries that makes it 2000 years without ever having to send a single soldier across her border without even sending a single soldier across her border india conquered and dominated china and india has had the capacity to project its her dominance her power anywhere around in the globe not through military hegemony but through soft power soft power na through her wisdom through her culture through her philosophy through her ideologies through her religion through her concepts so superpower need not necessarily mean hitler or napoleon or vand apdi or aakshi purinjada superpower na that will not last long at all you have seen this superpower now what comes to our mind immediately is usa now some years back erstwhile ussr russia 100 years back britain or spain or france but what about those years before british question mark nobody has told us that our india had been the superpower before the arrival of british even after so many islamic incursions none of the indians today know that india was the superpower for ages together therinja apro we will have that sense of pride of belonging to this nation illa apro nano indian nu solli ko sali ko aramichidume so nobody else wants us to do that under developed nation paatha kuda the african will say even if he is settled in america for hundreds of years he'll say i'm an african settled in us china karana keta he'll say i'm a chinese settled in us you go ask an indian he'll say i'm an american citizen avan tata party illa inge guduvanjeri gundalur inge viluporam virudhachalam irukom but he'll say i'm an american citizen green card vaangitan he and the vaarthai varadu i'm an indian gra vaarthai varadu you talk to him the way the way he speaks the nada uda bhavana everything as if on the america liye avan aayiram varsham porandu varandu appdiye generations together kandupidichade avan da madri pesuva i is it happening even when underdeveloped nations they say i am an african i am a czechoslovakian solumbodu why we indians are refusing that why 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 do indians lack that sense of pride because this is manipulated and they have wantedly brainwashed all our brains ellariyo seethu motta adichirukka and that would be uh, i will give you an example i am not talking without evidence put on the next slide 
greatest mahanubhav on earth yeah where is it here okay ah no this is okay see one of the mahanubhava quotes the annihilation of indian education by the british lord macaulay our then a founder of modern education in india he says i have not seen one person who is a beggar one person who is a thief i do not think we would ever conquer this country unless we break her india's spiritual and cultural heritage and therefore i propose that we replace her old and ancient system education system so that they will lose their self esteem so that they will lose their native self culture and they will become what we want them a truly dominated nation thomas babington macaulay in his speech to the british parliament in 1835 some people will say no no this is not there in the minutes of the meeting na paathen this is a misquote you can never say the other statement that he says is not there because it is definitely 200% that idvarikum yaro edikala inume yaravadu edutana you can say shastra university on this day 25th february very few in the minutes of the meeting like they did then because once we say something immediately there are steps by all other groups to somehow kind of create a good notion about them and a bad notion about us and we believe whatever they say so another quote he says we must at present do our best to form a class of persons indian in blood and color but english in taste in opinions in morals and in intellect and ipo namba irukirathu exactly the same speaking english thinking english eating english saapradhu kuda kaiyala saapta asingamo spoonala da the way we dress the way we talk the way we walk the way we think if we think in english we don't think in our vernacular regional languages tamil la pesina ah that status the same thing i talk in tamil enna da irundhalo sila per varamata so after this so because that this is the way we have been slowly systematically decimated it's an engineered history so that we lose the sense of pride of belonging to this nation anaka i would like to quote another person will durant i'm all quote i'm quoting all this from this author's shri t s narendran's book so he will address you after the end of this lecture maybe if you have questions you can ask him will durant he says nothing should more deeply shame a modern student than the inadequacy of his acquaintance with india if you don't know india it means you do not have true complete knowledge idu or foreigner solra but here all we want to know is only about the west we don't want to know about our nation but there are so many evidences to tell you how india was the mother of all inventions if you take the inventions list nobody in area per solva science na ka everything the westerners are the west Westerners found everything, right from electricity, right from Max, all science, aeroplanes, ships. They do me. I want to do something. 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 Inge, what we found has been plagiarized by them, and they give it to us as if they have invented everything, and we believe them. That is the most foolish part of it, because first thing, they declared all our vedas itihasas puranas as mythology mithya abrina false mithya in, in sanskrit means false so everything that goes against their wishes against what they cannot see if we cannot become truly indian with the, with the main point is namo culture spirituality aichita the super power status in india will be will come down to zero power because the entire super power status in india was built on this evidence that we are culturally and spiritually strong that is why even if we conquered other nations we didn't burn them down we didn't burn nations avo engaya adu namla conquer panna they will burn the villages they will loot our wealth they will ransack everything but we never did that we never did that we never raised down civilizations but 
so there are lots of differences between a benign superpower india superpower and then a innur nation superpower and then there is a lot of difference india should be the superpower because if india is the superpower then the whole world will will be at peace if some other nation is at superpower is has a superpower status you cannot expect a peace loving and peace loving nation peaceful world expect panna mudiyadhu because the edifice the foundation itself is wrong நீ போய் கான்கர்ட் பண்ணானா அந்த சிவிலைசேஷனையே அழிச்சிடு வாட் எவர் தே ஸ்பீக் தே ஷுட் நாட் ஸ்பீக் இன் தியர் ஓன் லாங்குவேஜ் பிகாஸ் ஆஃப் த கலோனியல் ரூல் நவ் வி த கன்னடா ஸ்பீக்கிங் பீப்புள் தே டோன்ட் நோ கன்னடா தெலுங்கு ஸ்பீக்கிங் பீப்புள் டோன்ட் நோ தெலுங்கு ஆல் த யங்ஸ்டர்ஸ் நோ ஓன்லி தேர் லாங்குவேஜ் டோன்ட் நோ ஆர் லாங்குவேஜ் ஹவ் மெனி தமிழ் யங்ஸ்டர்ஸ் இன் தமிழ்நாடு நோ தமிழ் தமிழ் தெரிஞ்சாலும் தமிழ் எழுத தெரியாது தமிழ் அப்படின்னு தான் சொல்லுவான் தமிழ்னு வர்றது Tamil is not able to learn Tamil. That's why it's not a status symbol for them. So, my point is, how can you prove that Bharat was a superpower? Now, you're talking so much. How can you prove that Bharat was a superpower 1700 years back? Tell me. Dina, I can show you many perspectives. First perspective as a civilization. Second perspective, global trade, GDP. Third, naval power. fourth education fifth indian arts this is just a sample because the time given to me is just one more hour this is just a sample in each of these perspectives how india has been at the top what would it do for us to rediscover our own nation namba bharata varshata kandupidike to bring it back to the super power status what does it take so first perspective as a civilization there have been many ancient civilizations roman greek egyptian sumerian all these civilizations are now non existent they are raised down beyond recognition from the present scene they are they have just erased so what happens all their gods whatever they were using whomever whomever gods they were worshiping all those gods are don't just the museums right now of those people who destroyed their civilizations so but today indian civilization still exists how why when all these civilizations were erased beyond recognition inniko after so many incursions after so many invasions ancient india was the cradle of civilization it is an accepted truth Indus Valley civilization has been given a date of almost 9.5 to 8 kilo years ago KYA at least minimum 7500 BCE is what historians accept 7500 varshathukku munnadi Indus Valley civilization irundathu and this is a published fact published in the very famous journal called nature this makes it one of the oldest civilizations and even after 7500 years we are still able to have at least some of it but at this rate in the madri or western dominance so western mohamo irundadna without anybody ruling us physically we will be losing out on our civilization that is my point you blow over western moham now the europeans have gone away from our soil the westerners have gone away from our soil not from our mind so if this is going to continue for another 50 years 7500 years are aiya the or civilization in or 50 years la ayinjidu that is why i'm making this point very clear will durant a westerner he says india was the motherland of all races நான் ஏன் வில் டியூரண்ட்டும் ஒரு மெல்ஸையோ இல்லை வேற யாரையோ கோட் பண்ணுறேன்னா இங்கே இருக்கிற ஒரு பட்டாச்சாரியார் கோட் பண்ணார்னா நீங்களாம் நம்ப மாட்டீங்க ஐ ஷுட் சே வில் டியூரண்ட் கோட்டட் ஆ வில் டியூரண்ட்டே சொல்லியாச்சா தட் இஸ் ஆர் மென்டாலிட்டி அன்லெஸ் வி லூஸ் திஸ் மென்டாலிட்டி அண்ட் கம் டு த ஐ வாஸ் வெரி ஹாப்பி இன்சிடென்ட்லி வென் ஐ சா யோர் டீன் சைக்ளிங் டு சாணக்கிய ஆடிட்டோரியம் ஏன்னா ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஸ்டெப் யூனோ கெட் பேக் டு சிம்பிள் லிவிங் lose your ego then you will grow to the greatest heights now the dean i irukona na illa periya car la irundha dhaan dean a irukka mudiyum illa or toyota innova illa periya vandila vandha dhaan 
and I, I'm reminded of this uh, joke. It, it's a fact. In the Swamiji, you know, the Swamiji, you know, Swamiji, you know, 10 years back, somebody said. And I asked, why? Epdi, nalla nyanu ma, nalla wisdom ma. Maybe he knows more shastras. Ah, avroda jeep, you know, perisar in the there. I saw that. So, and then I thought, oh, so people, padiche wale, ipdi na, oru Swamiji, you know, Swamiji, eda podra na, his car is 10 lakhs, your car anja lakshan na, so anda Swamiji is better than this Swamiji. How can we go to such, stoop to such low levels? So what, what is happening with us? Lose that status symbol. Get back to simple living. So, what I want to tell you is, the Will Durant Solra, India was the motherland of all races. And Sanskrit is the mother of all even European languages. Not Indian languages alone. See, every word matters. India is the motherland of all races. And Sanskrit is the mother of even European languages. And she is the mother of all philosophy. She is the mother of mathematics through the Arabs. Because they, Arab, Arabs took maths from us, from India. Through the Arabs, India is the mother of much of our mathematics. Through village community, she is the mother of self-government democracy. Panchayatala villages, we never needed high courts and supreme courts and uh, so many cases and files to judge who the innocent and who the victims are. Actually, because panchayat liye, there was this fear that in Atapu Pandana, the village panchayat was such a big thing for them. So through village community itself, India was the mother of self-government. So as a civilization, India has been the oldest civilization. In the discovery of Saraswati civilization in the early part of the 19th century, that is enough testimony because we have more than 2,400 archaeological sites. What we read is just Mohanjadaro, Ade, Arachamava, Arachin, Mohanjadaro, Harappa, Mohanjadaro, Harappa. Every day there are new inventions. WhatsApp, the Twitter, the Facebook, every day they are finding out something, no? But in the history books, the same material will be printed for 25 years, 30 years. And then, if you have a Facebook, you can use a WhatsApp, you can use a WhatsApp, and what's going to be an app, but the history syllabus alone for 30 years will be the same book. If you have a little print, you can use a little bit of the same book. In the same way. What is happening in India? Why don't these books get revamped? Why don't, why doesn't the truth come to the front? So, after the discovery of Saraswati civilization, in the early part of the 19th century, there have been 2,400 archaeological sites, mind you. And these have been excavated. The recent ones have been dated as, as old as 7,500 CE. So Max Muller, when the Rig Veda took a call on 1200 BCE, it doesn't mean that he is the uh, gospel. He, he wanted to raise down everything and bring India's history within that period. And unfortunately, this Saraswati civilization would be just a heart attack for him. After, after the discovery of Saraswati civilization, see how, how wrong he has been. 1200 is the date that he assigned to Rig Veda. And now the date is 7500 CE. You know, if you find out some other sites, it might go on to 10,000 BCE. Before BCE, BCE is before the common era. We don't use the terms BC and AD. Suppose, history I'm just reiterating for them. Uh, BC and AD are no more in use. Common era and before common era. CE and BCE are water news. So 7,500 years Munnadi, it's been dated BCE. So as a civilization, India is the oldest. So that itself makes it a superpower. Huh? How can it be a superpower? Can you call it a superpower? What is important is its economy. So next go to the global trade. Global trade, look at this uh, PowerPoint. Economic powerhouse, as an economic powerhouse, until the British arrived, India had been the strongest GDP-wise. 
So this is uh, as per contours of world economy by Angus Madison. That is the book reference. In one CE, GDP percentage, 32.02%, which means 33,750 million out of 1 lakh million. India's share alone is 32.02% of the world GDP in 1 CE. 1000 years later, 1000 CE, 28.03 percent. Konja da And 1700 CE, that's why we say 1700 years we have been a superpower. 1700 CE, India's share of GDP was 24.43 percent. That is 90,750 million out of 3,71,000 million. Which means India's share, her share, hovered anywhere around one third to one quarter. But now, that is even after Islamic incursions, even after so much of misappropriation of wealth, Yavlovo Kodi Kodi Kodiya Mohammed Ghazniyo Mohammed Goriyo Edithin Pogiyo, India's economy was so high. But then, scene changes apriye ulta. In 1950 CE, India's share, you know how, how much it was? From 24%, it comes to 4% after the British arrives. Economy-wise, from 24%, it comes to 4%. That is, if you want it in figures, 2,22,222 million out of 53 million world GDP. Why did this happen? India's economy grew after the British came. After the British colonial empire, India was in misery when uh, British... Uh, uh, all this is so well chronicled. India's misery under the British is so well chronicled. What about India's superiority before British arrived? Why is this an untold story? Why this remains an untold story? Why don't we... Why didn't we know that India was a superpower all these 1,700 years? It is just a historical evidence. How many more years do this is from 1 CE that we are talking. So the next one, naval power, shipbuilding progress in India, the maritime trade that we had, right from the Vedic period, right from Rig Veda, there are quotes, Yaste Pusha Navo Antaha Samudre, Rig Veda which means we had shipbuilding, ship maritime trade even during Vedic times. Of course, during Ramayana, Mahabharata, for those who think Ramayana and Mahabharata are all mythology, the lump poi, fictitious story, na, I just ask one thing. Ippo pona ni Ayodhya pakla. Ippo ni pona Kurukshetra pakla. If you go right now, you can see Panchavati, Chitrakota. All the places, as per the description of Valmiki, all these places exist. How can you say Ramayana is myth, mythology, Bhagavata is mythology, everything, everything that does not suit you becomes mythology. Anything that suits me becomes history. The historians. Historians first, there are some two qualifications that historians need to know. Anybody cannot write history. One, if you are going to write history, you should be totally unbiased. Only a person who, who does not have prejudice towards any particular nation, any particular mother, mother tongue, any particular language, any particular religion, a totally unbiased person, not prejudiced towards any caste or creed or religion or nation or language, only such a person can write history. Definitely. Second qualification for an historian, the evidence should be really scientific. You cannot imagine something and then give an imaginary date. These two have been violated for Indian history. Indian history, yeah, or European, first of all. Why should Indian history be written by Europeans? Why can't we write history? Europeans who never visited India. The second point, one, Indian history was written by Westerners. Two, Indian history was written by Westerners who never visited India. India la evlo varsham kurtanam panniye na mag India Indians ennum puri ila Lok Sabha la naale kena naraka porthu Rajya Sabha la naale kena naraka porthu teriyada. Evlo varsham India has such a rich tapestry 
that you can't write about india without experiencing india it's not like other nations it's not like other nations any nation for that matter if you want to write the history of a particular nation you have to live there you have to live there you have to experience it you have to get mingle become one among the citizens of those people and then write the history of such a nation but for us indian history has been written by all those people who never visited india and we still believe in them so in the naval power maritime trade na in ramayana or mahabharata not only there are places which are which can be visited right now those places in ramayana or mahabharata you can you can even say illa and ramayana mahabharata edin appo maybe this place was named after it so still it, it is a fictitious story in solala but there are evidences now in the in the field of archaeology astronomy archaeo astronomy and by using software like planetarium gold valmiki ramayana la valmiki kudutha dates the eclipses and all the stars astronomy vana shastra it's called vana shastra all that has been fitted into uh, uh, fitted into it paathana everything that valmiki says matches with it matches now it's everything has become scientific because of the arrival of archaeo astronomy genetics so many manayan archaeology so many planetarium gold and mari software nala ramayana mahabharat vedas now they are totally historical and they are no more mythology so if somebody says that's a mythology it's not a fictitious story at all so in the ramayan we have guha arranging for more than hundreds of boats navam shatanam panchanam apdina or vaartha irukku ramayanathile when bharata wanted to cross the river ganges and meet rama at chitrakuta he travel by boats he had come with lakhs and lakhs of armies yana pada kudra pada ter pada everything had come with him and guha helped him travel through the ganges transport ganges go across ganges using navam shatanam panchanam almost 500 boats were used and today research proves that shringi bera puram gra per liye there is a place near ayodhya near Ch- near chitrakuta and the soil underneath is wet mud so there is every possibility that water was flowing through that region today we have scientific evidence in the mahabharat also there are shlokas which say they traveled by uh, ships which could face heavy winds okay if you are going to consider all this as myth still i have kautilya's arthashastra varaha mihira's brihat samhita vikramaditya's during vikramaditya's reign and other literature like yukti kalpataru written by boja which has references to indians using rafts boats ships there in yukti kalpataru he says na sindhu gad yarghati loha bandham he says don't construct ships using too much of iron because there is magnetism in the midst of the ocean and if you use too much of iron in the ships your iron bolts nuts everything will get attracted towards that magnetism and that, that is every possibility that the ship will sink which means indians knew the art of manufacturing building ships thousands and thousands of years before anybody else in the world could knew could know it indians knew naval indians had so much naval power indians knew the ship building art there are even tamil sangha sangha literature agananur le iruk 149th pardon it says tamilians those who will belong to the dravida dravida desha they travel to foreign nations we think that exports imports idella ipo 100 years ada nadakkirathu that's the impression that we have that all these imports and exports are trading with foreign nations so it's all a recent development no in agananur tamilians had traveled tamilians had traveled to foreign nations to export pearls corals elephant tusks sandalwood kramb kramb uh, what do you call it cinnamon cinnamon okay cloves sorry cloves through ships they had traveled long 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 back and even in uh, you would have read in history poom puhar korkai misri they were all harbors right so definitely there was so much of naval power and ship building was our fort and that is why these english britishers could not uh, digest that fact it seems when the britishers entered india 
300 ships were manufactured at the same time in in a in a place at bombay could you think they could uh, they could have digested it that's why they brought the east india company refused to allow trading through indian ships they refused to allow trading through indian ships apro indian ships la trade panna they imposed high taxes you had to pay triple the tax double triple four times the tax and uh, if indian ships were allowed to sail you had to employ englishmen englishmen in indian ships and finally they banned indian ships totally in 1863 appo thane kapalotiya tamil engra vaavu chidambara pillai all that you know so which means and the alavuk they banned it and now they say that the art of ship building has now disappeared in india and now we are brainwashed to such a level that it is the westerners who invented ships and taught us maritime trade everything they take it from us just make it disappear from india for a, for a few years for hundreds of years and then they give it back to us as if it is their own invention and they more the education system mekale says everybody was so educated then why did he introduce this modern system of education there was not a single person in india who was uneducated india's excellence in education i can give you almost 20 to 30 educational institutions examples of educational institutions universities which prevailed thousands of years back in india nariya gurukulam irundade maharishi started gurukulams if you are not going to uh, accept that period i have the next period where kings and others kings and other scholars established educational institutions takshashila vishwavidyalaya indian education has always been universal education that's why it's called vishwavidyalaya it has always taught subjects which will benefit the whole world and or particular or a sect ko particular caste particular creed abadi kadaiyadu it's always universal education so it's named vishwavidyalaya takshashila vishwavidyalaya for 5th century bce to 6th century bce established during chandragupta maurya's rule this was located in punjab takshashila angad 18 miles from the town of ravalpindi it was 18 miles from the town of ravalpindi and lawyers like chanakya doctors like kaumara jeevan who treated people who treated injured warriors they were teachers in this takshashila vishwavidyalaya 18 subject 18 subjects were taught in these educational institutions including political science first thing that came to my mind marubadiyo india super power aganona first thing that we need to do is please introduce political science even for first standard students illada pona anybody can become an mla anybody can become an mp ingrada modala marina da super power india agum even for an ias for a job pona kuda qualification kekra for collectors you need to pass for post, police officers you need to pass degrees and but for positions above that ayyo adu romba mela adu konme padika vendam that is the position in india no so you go higher and higher onume padika vendam so apdi first we need to know political science you need to know politics proper true politics dharmic politics and that was taught in takshashila Vid- vishwavidyalaya rajaneeti in peru when rama or krishna were rulers the first thing that they were taught was rajaneeti how to administer there is one whole chapter in ramayana called kachit sarga where rama tells bharata how to rule the nation aduve theriyama how to sorrentify the nation adu mattu therinji appra namba politicians a ardunga that is a very pathetic scene so political science is what we need right now in educational system rajaneeti that politics both citizens ordinary citizens should know and those who are going to rule both of them will benefit by it because only then they will know whom to vote for whom not to vote for and once you get voted what to do and what not to do both ways so medicine ayurvedam arthashastram economics every subject talk of every subject it was taught in 5th century bc in takshashila vishwavidyalaya ipo ipo eppadi nam america poi advanced studies pandromo america moham it since all the other nations had this india moham 
they used to come to India to, uh, to do advanced studies. I'm expecting that superpower status back in India. We need a lot of such institutions where people from America, people from the West, people from Europe would say, I'm going to India for further studies. And that should be the status symbol for them now. So that is what we expect right now. It seems people from Germany, Germans, Tibetans, Chinese, they were students studying in such Indian universities. Taksha Sri Langarde, my revered guru Krishna Premi Swamigal would say, Takshna Chinese la male mountain. Because this Takshashila University was established in a cave-like mountain, maybe it got the name Takshashila because of that. Or Bharata's sons, he had two sons, Rama Lakshmana Bharata Chaturnadan, Bharata's sons, two sons, Takshaka and Pushkara. Pushkara Vartamgra Yadamu in the Takshashila Pakatli Rindrika. So there is every possibility that it got its name from the sons of Bharata, Takshaka and Pushkara. Okay, going on to the next university, Nalanda University, you all know about it. It was established in Bihar near Bastiapur. There is also a railway station by name Nalanda. That we know. But how many of us know that almost 10,000 students studied there under 500 tutors? And it had three libraries named Ratnasagaram, Ratnodadi, Ratnaranjakam. Ure University, 10,000 students. 500, 10,000 students are gone, and they teacher are gone. Abdi Lama, 500 teachers and three libraries. Who are these Britishers to say, Westerners to say that we did not know education, we did not have this formal system of education, we did not have universities. Tinna Padlikudana, who said this? India Tinna Padlikudana, and the Nalanda Vishwa Vidyalaya was established in 2 century BCE. Sculpture, medicine, economics, music, vocational training. Kai Toril, Ella Handicrafts, everything was imparted here. Then Vikramashila Vishwa Vidyalaya, have you heard of it? Vikramashila Vishwa Vidyalaya was established in Bagalpur district. And there were eight main tutors, 108 tutors under them, teaching Dharma, Logic, Tarkam, Sahitya, Nyaya Shastra, Mantra Shastra. There was a shift, you can see this shift in education towards Mantra, Tantra, Siddhas. But it was totally destroyed during 1193 CE. So there, I can go on and on and on with so many institutions. Harsha established institutions, educational institutions. King Harsha, Kurukshetra, Ujjain, Vallabhi, Hyung Sang and Megasthenes, they write about all this. Harsha himself, those days, the kings themselves were great scholars. They knew several languages. Swati Tirinal Maharaja, it seems he knew 13 languages to 15 languages, around 13 to 15, including German language, Persian, Yellamedaryuma. So the person who rules the country should be totally versatile. The king was so versatile, he himself was a scholar, he wrote books like Ratnavali, Priyadarshika, Naga, Nandam. They are politicians. Compose, you must be a scholar, you must be an educationalist, you must know what is happening around you. Such people were people who ruled India. And generally we think Indians, they never had a formal written recorded history. But Harsharapati Banar biography that's called Harsha Charitram. So many thousands of years back, we had this practice of writing biographies. And that is, of course, it's a recorded history. Where king, every arasakshi purunja, abde avanu writing enna. What were his writings? We had written history, recorded history, not only in the form of such kavyas, but pana olele, tarya madal, palm leaves, manuscripts. No, just because we don't know to read them now, doesn't mean that Indians never had recorded history. Kashi Vishwavidyalaya. Kashi, le, the people used to go from down south to north to Kashi for advanced studies. And Kalyanath la Kashi Yatra no no Where uh, the bridegroom goes with the umbrella and the walking stick. And usually those students used to go for advanced studies. Usually, if you go for advanced studies, abdiye, the Brahma Vicharo, abdiye, poi sanyasa maridwa. And nala ille la vanda, you don't, you don't need to go for Kashi na imponna kudukrempa. That is how Kashi Yatra started. Now what remains is just the umbrella and the walking stick. So, <laughs> at least I thought, at least and the umbrella and the walking stick are in me, 
it let, it, let it remind us of the rich education that we had at Kashi thousands of years back. Let that be a point in history now. Let that be a record of history in Anaktonit and the Kashi Yatran. <laughs> so we can state so many education institutions such as Vidya Kendram said Navadvipa, then Madhusudana Saraswati, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and uh, Minister of Prataparudra, Rai Ramananda. Ange Padichavar, institution at Avanti run by King Vikramaditya, Kalidasa learnt there. Kalidasa's Kavyas are still here. Ipo Namaka, Samskrito Ella poet, Kalidasa's epics, Kavyas, they, they will also get destroyed. Kondanal Kecha, 100 years Kecha, or historian Varuma, there was no poet by name Kalidasa. Abdin Namakur history Edi Daruma, and we will, we will say yes, because none of us know. Shakuntalam, now, none of us know Megadudam now. Fifty years after, those names also will get erased. Shakuntalam, Megadudam, Adukud Erka. Then they will say, well, Kalidasan ne uta kade And then we will say, yes, yes, definitely Kalidasan kade adhu. Nii enna sulru na dasanu dasana arke. That is what we will say. So, there have been so many, I, I, I can go on and on and on with education institutions. Hampi, it, the city itself was named Vidyanagaram. And the pere, Harikara Bukanaya, and after that, Krishna Devaraya, it was run by Vidya Ranyar. Vidya Nagaram na the Kupera, Aprana Vijay Nagaram Neper, Ape Dikshudar, Vedanta Desikar, Vadiraja, Vyasaraya, Nilakanta Dikshudar, all of them were like lions proceeding from the caves of Hampi. They were so great. And last but not the least, I wanted to mention the big institution by, built by Raghunath Naik at Tanjaur. Ingeye or a peri institution in Trika. Tanjaur liye. Big Vidya Kendra during the times of Raghunath Naik. It was patronized by Sarvoji Maharaja. And Raghunath Naik's minister Govind Dikshitar built many libraries. Saraswati Mahal in Girkatala. Maybe that's why Shastra is built in Tanjaur here. To remind us, uh, remind us of Raghunath Naik's great work, Vidya Kendra. So, so there had been so many education institutions. But what happened to all of these? I told you, once there is a conquest by other nations, what they do is first demolish the educational institutions. One, so that knowledge first they demolish, they burn libraries. So many libraries were burnt. The practice of having libraries and maintaining libraries was there in India first. Koshisthanam na pere, adhika Saraswati Bandaram na pere. We had the biggest, the biggest Saraswati Bandaram library in Kashmir. That is why Adi Shankara and Ramanuja went to Kashmir. Sarvagnya peta tle, eri nada, you can, you can accept him as an acharya. Ipona poli samyar, allarume erla me, wakara peta, sarvagnya peta, that's not like that. Kashmir la sarvagnya peta tle ni poi eri, if you have, you have to win, you have to do the digvijaya. That was the biggest library there. But then, nothing of it remains now. Because of all the conquests, universities were demolished, libraries were burned down, temples at Somnath, Pushkar, Kashi, Mathura, Ayodhya, Hampi, everything raised down. If you go to Hampi, you can just see the ruins of that. Everything. Everything, the best part is, they take everything from India. There is a flight of the science and technology from India to all the other nations. And then they burn it down. They, all our Sanskrit texts have been translated into other languages. All our, so total plagiarism. All our Sanskrit texts, Max, science, the art of shipbuilding, plane making, everything, everything has been translated into other, other nations' languages. And then they burn down our library so that we don't know anything of it. But now, at least we know that this has happened to us. India, India was not just this India. India was so huge. It included Afghanistan, Gandhara Desham. Kandahar is Gandhara Desham. That's why Gandhari got her name. Mahabharata, like Gandhari, Shakuni's sister, famous Shakuni's sister. And the Gandhari came from Kandahar. We lost Kandahar. We lost Gandhara Desha. We lost Sindhu, Pakistan, though it's in our national anthem. We lost Sindhu Desha. That's the place where Jayadrata was born. Jayadrata is the person who killed Abhimanyu. Analda Mahatma Gandhi put it clear on more. Abhimanyu, a call upon one order, not in a command. I'm very good through. Let's Sindhu Desha go. Sindhu is Pakistan. Sindhu Desha is Pakistan. So Rig Veda has much references to that Sindhu Nadi. 
and some people say it's hindu became hindu hindu became hindu hindu indus india that's how we india got its name so we have uh, quotations from ramayana and arunachala kaviraya's ramanatakam stating that there were 56 pradeshas in india pataliputram da patna indraprastham is the present day delhi kalinga desha is madhya pradesh kanyakubjam where ajamila lived that is kannauj Punjab is where Draupadi was born. Panchali is all right. Punjab is where Panchali was born. Shauvira Desha, Anartaka Desha is Dwaraka. Then Marwad is Marudharvam, Rajasthan. Vidharva Desha, Avanti is the present Ujjain. So, Bhojam, Madurai, Vrishni, Agra, Andakam is Gwalior. Kosala Desha, Ayodhya, Vanga Desha is Bengal. Manipuram, Arjuna visited Manipur and he married a Manipuri princess. Magadam is Bihar. Utkalam is Orissa. Gurjiram is Gujarat. We have all these states. If Ramayana, Ramayana has references to all these states. If Ramayana is mythology, then Gujarat is also mythology. Gujarat no rule is not. State is not. If Ramayana is mythology, Rajasthan is also mythology. Madhya Pradesh is also mythology. Tamil Nadu is also mythology. Yet so is Sera Pandi Rajakalo. Nobody exists other than the Western, Westerners. Abde vachikla nambo. So if, see the, basically why I'm telling you so much is, there was, there were 56 states and in each of the state, so much of diversity, different food habits, different ways of dressing, different languages and uh, different culture that Macaulay and other Westerners could not digest the fact that India could be a single nation with so much of diversity. In a Yivlo diversity path, anybody else would think that it's just a conglomerate. India is just a conglomerate of several people from several nations. And then the Velinad Lende from foreign nations, Avava, Inga migrate Panni. It's just a conglomerate of several nations. But they understood that there were four or five common threads throughout the nation, linking the whole nation. One, the common language, Sanskrit. All the Shastras, all the Kavyas, everything was in Sanskrit. Two, Vedas, that was the common literature of everybody. Itihasas, Puranas, that was the common, common uh, people were reading Itihasas, like Ramayana and Mahabharat. Temples and the gods, throughout the nation, temples and the gods were similar. So all these five points which link the country they wanted to just raise them down so that they can project India as just a conglomerate of several nations. The bigger we become, the, the power that we can influence. So they wanted to divide and rule. That is why these five points they took. If Sanskrit is the common language, make it extinct. Make it extinct. Bring that kind of a hatred bring casteism into it. See, Sanskrit is not based on caste at all. It's for every caste. It's for everybody. But bring casteism, in, casteism into it so that you can break it down. So they made Sanskrit extinct. They call Vedas and Itihasas as mythology so that uh, anybody, any Tom, Dick and Harry will read only Harry Potter will not read Harikatha. Hari, Harry Potter is now fam more famous than Ramayana or Mahabharata. What do we know? Do we know all these points? that Ramayana has. Why, uh, so Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad, all this was declared as myth. And temples and gods throughout India, if it's the same, then criticize it as idol worship. idol worship. So whatever unites the nation, only provoke their enemy, the, provoke their envy. So all these five points, Sanskrit or Vedas or Itihasas or Puranas or temples or gods, all this provoked their envy. They wanted to raise everything down. Apo, if they wanted to make Sanskrit extinct, why do Westerners have this language and Sanskrit libraries? Almost there are several hundreds of Sanskrit libraries in Western nations. I can give you a sample of 10 to 11 Sanskrit libraries which are there in the West. Lotrobe University at Bundura City started in 1967. Sanskrit University at Sydney right from the 1850s, at Vienna, Austria, at Denmark, 
Arhasil University from 1928, Copenhagen, Sanskrit. There are Sanskrit departments, Sanskrit libraries at Berlin Universität in Germany in, from 1948, Bonn Universität at Wittenberg, Oxford University, Cambridge, Edinburgh, all have Sanskrit departments. So, foreigners are learning the language more than Indians. There is a kind of a hatred being slowly being creeping into this. They want to divide and rule. Yeah. So there are so many universities in Netherlands from 1811 Oslo in Norway has Sanskrit libraries. From 1915 in Warsaw, Poland, Poland, Stockholm at Sweden, Berkeley University, California, Chicago, all our original Sanskrit books are strewn and disseminated and distributed freely across the world. Do you think we gave them freely on our, of our own accord? They seized our books and got all our books translated and we are happy here talking in their languages, thinking English, speaking English. I'm not bothered about the crores and crores of wealth amassed by Ghori Muhammad or Muhammad Ghajni, but I'm bothered about these 100,000 books because this is a transfer of knowledge, which means we are transferring our superpower status freely to them, to be plagiarized by them. So this we need to get back. And there are so many foreign historians, uh, like Megasthenes, like Huing Sang, like Onitrix. After their visit to the education institutions, they write India, how it has been ancient India, how beautifully India has been managed, how it was a superpower. Huing Sang or Onitrix and uh, Megasthenes, they write, Indians are very strict in their eating habits. Now I was just comparing, that was in 4 BCE, 2017 versus 4 BCE, I was just trying to do a comparison. Megasthenes writes, Indians are strict in their eating habits. And burgers and everything is whatever they eat. Indians were strict in their eating habits. In students follow strict celibacy. They don't eat flesh and meat. At the beginning of the year, Megasthenes writes about that. It seems the king called for an assembly of the scholars and then he would discuss how agriculture and uh, cows can uh, be developed and how, the, how you can uh, improve this. And Megasthenes writes, Indians ate from golden bowls. Golden bowls, don't demand that from Shastra University now. So that is 4th century BCE. And he writes, kings do not sleep during the daytime. That's a very important point. Politicians should not sleep even during night time, according to me. Even during night time, they shouldn't sleep. They should be bothered about the country. And he writes, even if the king is being massaged by bodyguards, even during those moments, the king continues to think about the nation and its prosperity. So what kind of kings we have had? And then he says, Indians follow several, rule, several rules and the basic point for their superpower status is that they have separate lands for warfare. There have been so many battles in India, yet how the Indian civilization continued? You know how? Yuddha Bhumi Vere, the ordinary civilians were never affected by the wars during those times. So, so, ordinary civilians will never be affected. The agricultural lands, the residential lands will be separated from the war lands. So, even after thousands of years of battles, the normal ordinary civilian was never affected by it. That is why Indian civilization lasts so long. So these are points which are very, very critical, which we should know. And India had such great military base, but she never used it against other nations for her supremacy. Megasthenes writes all this. Agriculture, the backbone, uh, we can see many hard-working farmers in the fields. And Huing Sang says, Indians have food only after they bathe. Very important point. Huing Sang, yao the number follow up on no. Should eat only after they bathe, bathe and they eat only fresh food. HL Sabramato Hing Sang, so you Chinese can also follow up under an element like Poyuko. All of them don't eat from one plate. 
So once a plate has been used by somebody, others don't eat from the same plate. All these are Huing Sang's um, notes. And he says there are many sannyasis and Indian women have equal rights to education. That you can see from the Vedic times, Gargi, Maitri, so many sutras, these women were scientists themselves. And so we have never had this necessity of uh, women uh, liberation movements. Somebody asked me when uh, I was talking about this uh, women empowerment. Why don't uh, Indians have so many women liberation movements? Now I said, when were, when, were, when were women suppressed in India truly to have such liberation movements? In other nations you need liberation movements because there was so much suffrage. Women were ne never given voting, voting rights. Women were never given any rights at all. They were used as products. But in India, women are gods. We worship not only women gods, we worship women as gods. So we have never wanted, the, we, we never, we, there was never a necessity for uh, women liberation rights at all. Men liberation rights because the way the women are marching past and forth and uh, the way they are uh, trying to follow Hitler, in some, some years, in some years, men will need men liberation uh, associations. So, Omnic, Omnic Tricks writes this after his visit to Takshashila. That's not about Shastra women. That's about the women and other... other. <laughs> yeah, here, here I can see a lot of decent people. You go to the airport, then you will say the statements. Statement, you will copy my statement. You go to the airport, watch every person who comes out for five minutes, you stand there. Go to a mall, go to a shopping mall. Go to an evening college in uh, Bombay. Bangalore, Bombay kudu pohanda, Bangalore poro. You go there, 9 o'clock in the night, you stand in the middle of a road and you see what, what I said will be 100% true. I heard some uh, grudges from this side, that's why I'm explaining to them. <laughs> so here, so there, anyway, uh, coming back to this, so Onitrix writes, after his visit to Takshashila, he writes, there are many yogis in India who can cure diseases themselves. And in India, food itself is used as medicine. Medicine is chemicals used. We have never needed that at all. Our food system itself has medicinal value. And uh, uh, he goes on and on. I have finished uh, with education, I think, civilization, education, naval power. I wanted to finish off with uh, Indian inventions. Can you, can anybody from the students, can you tell me what Indians invented? Now you are all university students. It's at least one now that they are Number zero, other than Mokterio. That's a number zero. Number zero, wa? In a number zero, wa? Okay, number zero. Other Tavira? Trigonometry. Arya Bata? Huh? Surgery. Chess. Huh? Nuclear missiles. Good. That is. I, I think others will not know. Okay, huh? Yoga. They are claiming that they have founded, uh, they are the, they are copywriting yoga also. They will definitely copyright it. So better we get back. But we have had more than thousand inventions. India. Thousand inventions. power talk Thousand inventions, Kamala, we can give from uh, our Vedic texts, from uh, the literature. First ever dictionary, dictionary in the concept, eh? Niruptam, Adi Nikandu by Yaskar. Yaskara, it's an anger to Vedas. And the etymology, how the word comes, and the etymology, first ever dictionary, eh? Indians can put it Jyotisham, astrology based on astronomy. Astrology, na, Verumakaya Pata, on a current one day, I love on a Kapatosha Kalanoido, Adamadrila. 
true astrology based on astronomy forecasting the rainfall for almost 25 to 30 years disaster management to solrale disaster management you has us has spent so many crores of rupees for disaster management namma kitta panchangathla kudutana yaradu or panchangam padikira vare soliduvaru inda varsham unakku inda edathla bhoogambam there's going to be a tsunami here there's going to be a earthquake here cyclone here eclipses here namma panchangathle paatha eclipse adutha varsham adukadutha varsham eppo eclipse nadakka poruthu we can give it before itself so it's not just a forecast of individual destiny jyotishya shastra is not just onaka based on the date of birth or or individual oda destiny mattu illa the entire nation's destiny the entire world's destiny based on max that was given by 18 rishis including vyasa kashyapa narada aryabhatta varaha mihira everybody knows grammar indians invention vyakaranam panini is famous for it poems that poetic ability one of the foreign visitors they write most of the indians are poetic in their nature swabhavamave poems for the way they think it's poetic concept of time based on the gati of chandra and surya indians gave this concept of time medicine not only surgery ayurvedam is the essence of rigveda danvantri chavana charaka samhita apa chavana prakashan solrala all that is named after those rishis chavana charaka danvantri surgery was by sushruta but besides that we have vagbatas ashtanga ashtanga sangraham kanadas nadi vigyanam on the pulse pate unakenna vyadi nadi after even after so many scans just or jala doshathukku ct scan panna mri scan panna and x ray panna in the x ray panna and after so many scans he says use this vicks bottle and then somebody will say no no it's already banned don't use this it's banned now so that is not the way uh, medicine should go so for a superpower status the country needs to be free of diseases and now at present even children are getting chronic diseases why this is happening so much of adulteration so much of pollution the st- the lifestyle has to change and here there is nadi vigyanam nadi pariksha nagarjuna's yoga ratna mala lolamba raja's vaidya jeevanam ore ore shushruta thane namak theriyum there are almost 20 doctors chalakya vigyanam kanna netra chikitsa for eye treatment indians found that out and then agastya vaidya shastram we had have we have had uh, veterinary doctors gaja chikitsa ashwa chikitsa go chikitsa vrisha chikitsa for elephants for horses indians were people who invented veterinary on the field adhe madri engineering field shilpa shastra shilpa samhita vastu shastra kashyapa shilpa shastra prasada mandanam they are all books which talk about not only construction construction of buildings ipo irukra engineer ku building da construct panna theriyum or fly over da construct panna theriyum eppo thalaila vilumo yaarkum theriyadu so that is the way now engineers are doing but in those years just imagine tanjavur in the kovil bragadeeshwarar kovil how old it is 1000 years 1000 years ku munnadi namak engineering illaya in the britishers colonial rule ka pranda namak engineering therinjada modern education ka pro system ka pranda engineering how were such tall temples how were they all built how were sabha mandapams it talks the shilpa shastra talks of construction of temples buildings houses mansions forts planning of villages cities sabha mandapa nataka ranga sangeetha mahals music theaters and uh, building chariots machines weapons ships planes ornaments dams across rivers karikala chola's dam is a very good evidence and all this has been given thousands of years back so many thousands of years back planes aeroplanes were invented by wright brothers adana namu padikra history and geography and invention wright brothers and solrava ella wrong they are wrong brothers manuscripts found at baroda library gives evidence of yantra sarvaswam a book by bharadwaja which talks of manufacturing planes baroda the olechuvadi its vaimanika prakaranam gra prakaranathla how to build aeroplanes bharadwaja talks of it electricity again an invention where india indian books saudamini kala by ishwara and agastya shakti sutra talks of electricity 
solar energy indians were the ones who invented it amsumat tantram abingirathu bharatwaj edinadhu again solar energy is a concept which india gave to the world ship building i already told you in detail yukti kalpataru in no other nation you can see so many beautiful sculptures figurines carved even an elephant tusks or elephant dantatla kuda carva irukum sandalwood rajagopuram if you can see in stones in ornaments no other nation can excel india in shilpa in engineering in arts in music in dance 18 instruments were used 18 vadyangal why i am mentioning all this is slowly everything is going off everything is being erased 18 vadyangalla we have just now violin mridangam and tabla ganjira or naal anju vadyam da everything is being at least music these instruments or one stringed in stringed instrument one wind instrument one percussion aduva the menjirudhu but in most of the 64 arts there are 64 arts 64 kalaigal indian inventions towards art we have given the world 64 different types of arts we don't even know the names of those 64 arts now these are there in the shaivagama shastras and in bhagavata shridariya vyakhyana geetam and vadyam and natyam are just one, three of those 64 arts alekyam visesha visesha kachedyam where you carve on wood tandula kusuma vali vikaraha where you make rangolis and the kolam podradalla indian inventions akshada vechi podrathu pushpata vechi flowers vechi with rice then uh, pushpas taranam painting and uh, art work using flowers and colors dashana vasana alankara we think makeup dye the clothes dyeing no giving colors to clothes all that is indian invention dashana vasana alankara is um, bridal makeup dyeing clothes mani bhumi ka karma building marble towers shayana rachanam udavadyam udagada jalatarangam abdin or that's an instrument where you play it using uh, different bowls filled with water then malya malya krathana vikalpaha making garlands 64 types of arts karna patra banga tattoos no we think tattoos adala western then tattoos are indian invention the ellame all the 64 arts are all indian india's contribution towards the world sugandha yukti making incense sticks making scents making perfumes so i can go on magic the art of magic indra jalam ne pere it seems in those days noola apdi sky la viduvala they used to just just let loose a thread in the sky and one person would climb up using that small piece of thread he would climb on the thread aakashathla apdi eruvana that is all gone now what we could see on the streets 50 years back now we don't have it now we don't have it the korang korangatra vidyalana kuda ipo ellarume engineers tha ellarume doctors tha ellarume they were all match sticks in a match box match box la irukra match stick ellame same adhe alavu cut a irukum adhe madri design a irukum so what is this system of education i i don't understand when each one of us have our own strengths our own weakness somebody might like to uh, excel in music somebody might like to excel do magic somebody li- might e- like to do rangolis cookery cooking is an art somebody might like to cook but idu ellathum avichu uniform products madri mold madri education indian education system is what physics you know the same physics she knows ona kambadu mark na avuluk 60 mark that is the only difference what chemistry you know she knows the same chemistry everything is standardized i don't understand how education can be standardized and generalized for each and everybody like this we are not products we are individual identities so first thing that india has to do for a superpower status get back to ancient indian system yaar yaar ke edu pudikumo adile varada max va 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 na varadu and the time avanukku varliye varliye ni mandala kutradha vida vandathu avanukku konjam poda vittana innu avan evlavo kandupidichirukka mudiyum no that would that that should be the concept whatever is your strength 
Indian education system should be now designed in such a way that find out the strength of that particular child. You must be able to do it by your sixth standard or maybe even further fourth, fifth whether that particular boy or girl has this talent in science or max or arts. And then give a scope for that student to shine in that particular area of interest. You will see so many more other inventions in the superpower future India. You will have other 10,000 or 1 lakh inventions. Nobody wants us to find out anything. It's now all vomiting concept. Now let's get back to our roots. So what I feel now is... Uh, I, maybe I should discuss this with you. But before that, uh, I wanted uh, the author of uh, Ancient India Unacknowledged Superpower, Sri T.S. Narendran, to at least give us a gist of how India's history has been decimate, decimated and what was their plan, how do we get out of it. At least for a few minutes, please give us with evidence because I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian. He has collected more than 500 sources of evidences from 500 materials, how British have engineered and induced as this false history. For at least a few minutes, tell us how this system needs a revamp and why the uh, Britishers have done this to us. If you can do this, we will then ask you questions. You can ask questions to me or to him. We will try to answer so that this discussion forum, it should not stop with a lecture. India, ancient India, what do I need to do now to rediscover Bharat? What do we need to do now in the next five years or in the next ten years? Let's plan. Let's bring out the student power. Let's bring out the power in the normal, ordinary, layman citizens to restore the superpower Bharat status. What do we do to rediscover? So let's discuss this and then finish off the uh, power talk with solutions to rediscover Super Bharat. I have written a few solutions, but let us all get together and then uh, discuss this. So maybe you can tell us. Will you use this mic? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Shemati Vishaka Hari. Uh, it's an immense pleasure coming back to Tanjore. Uh, I have a personal connection here with Tanjore. I'm a, I'm a native of Tanjore, and I studied in uh, uh, Kalyana Sundaram Higher Secondary School. And uh, my brother actually studied here, so I have a deeply personal connection with Shastra University also. So it gives me an immense pleasure to be in front of you. And I don't know if I can do a justice uh, similar to what Shemati Vishaka Hari has done. She, has, she gave a wonderful talk about you know taking us back through to uh, 2,000 years ago, right? So what I want to do is, I don't, I don't want to take a lot of time. I want to get a particular perspective before we go into the solutioning part, right? The perspective that I want to drive down is the idea that the Britishers engineered a false history, right? That's a tall acquisition we have made. All of us studied, have been studying modern history for so many years, and here we are standing in front of you and making an acquisition, a blatant acquisition that the history that we are studying is completely false. Right? I just want to take you to a small journey in terms of how this whole thing was engineered, and then I leave it to you. You can actually Google, you can go back to your, uh, you know, your books and then figure out how the whole history has come up. Right? Let me give you a synthesis of what we know normally as a history. Our history books, if you look at it, are divided into three major parts. Part one is what they call as the Hindu history, or the ancient history as it has been monikered. Then comes the medieval history, which starts from the Buddhist era, which is 600 BCE, down to the British period. And the third period that has been divided is the modern history, as, we, as they call it. Okay, so this is nothing but James Mill. Okay? There was an author called James Mill, which uh, Srimati Vishaka Hari mentioned, has never visited India. But in 1818, he has written a very influential book, very, very influential book called The British History of India, in which he actually gives a chronology. This is when the segmentation of India actually started. It started off as a Hindu nation, as a Muslim nation, and then as a 
um, you know, the Christian nation. So this actually has a direct correlation with religion on one side and the so-called ancient, medieval, and modern in terms of terminology. Okay, now let's take a, let's, let's, let's play along with this particular idea, right? That our history has been, so what, you know, it's been divided into three periods. Now this actually is a very, very strong skirmish. You know, there's a, there's a very, totally uh, there's actually a very uh, mischievous thing that he has done. What he has done is, you know, he has projected the ancient in history, the parts that were before 600 BCE as a gobbledygook as something that, you know, is ahistorical, is mythological. That is where all our Puranas, the Vedas, the Itihasas, everything, you know, gets trampled upon and the original history as we know as the ancient Hindu history has been called as ahistorical. This is a very important point. A lot of people come and say Indians don't have a history. It is because of this particular thought process. I'll come back to the evidence, I'll come back to the specifics. So the second period that he talks about is the invasion period. You know, we read invasion after invasion after invasion. And then, you know, we finally say British came and saved us. All right. So let's, uh, let's, let's actually take 600 BC and ask this question. Why should Indian history, the so-called medieval history, start with the year 600 BC? Can anybody make a guess? Why not 8th century BC? Why not 1200 BC? Why not 1500 BC? Why 600? First of all, do you agree that 600 is an important demarcation? A lot of history books actually start with Mahajanapadas, right? If you know the history, they start with Mahajanapadas, then Buddha is born, and then, you know, the Mauryas come in, and then the Gupta era come, comes in, and then Harsha comes in, and then starts the Muslim invasion one after the other. Muhammad bin Qasim comes in, then Ghazni, then Gori, and then, you know, you can, you can tag along what I'm saying, right? I hope you can resonate what I'm saying here. But have you ever asked this question, why is history class boring? Because we are never allowed to ask these questions. These are fundamental questions. Why is the year 600 BC so important in the modern chronology as we read it? Let me give you the answer. I mean, can anybody make a venture? Yeah. Brilliant. No, it was not 600 BC, but he gave, he gave the name Porus. Okay. Now, this is called the anchor sheet, sheet anchor. Okay. What we are saying here is, the historians, I'm taking British historians who actually rewrote our history, they needed an anchor which they can claim to be true. Okay, and they rejected all the Indian sources, and I'm not making up, you can actually go back to James Mills, you can go back to uh, William Jones's history, you can go to Smith's history, you can actually read these, these are publicly available in, on the internet, if anybody's interested in history, you can actually go through how they actually did it. Right, so coming back to the point, they needed what is called as a sheet anchor, a sheet anchor is a specific period which nobody can question. Okay, they actually took nothing from Indian sources. They took Greek sources. Mm. Alexander's invasion is mentioned in Greek sources. You cannot find a major Shastra describing Alexander's invasion because Alexander did not invade India. No. Let us be very precise about it. Alexander invaded a borderland kingdom. He had seven, he, he actually met with a total of about seven to eight different armies. Yes, he defeated Purushottaman, but he did not conquer India. Let us be very, very clear. He was actually afraid of the Magadha Empire. Right? Any which way. So they said, Alexander came in the year 4th century BCE. Let us use this as our anchor to redefine our history. Now, here are the objections to it. The, what is the source? What is the source when we say Alexander came in the year 4th, 4th BCE? Okay? The commonly cited source is Megasthenes Indica. Okay, we all we have heard about Megasthenes. Megasthenes came during the period of Seleucus Nicator. He married, you know, a local uh, princess and all that, right? But when did Megasthenes come? He came 50 years later. Okay, we have been talking about evidence, and one of the important things which we are never taught in the school is the importance of a scientific way of knowing facts. And over here, what is called as a primary evidence. There is primary evidence and there is secondary evidence. A primary evidence is an evidence that we can agree upon. It is usually contemporary. So if Alexander came here, and if there was somebody who belonged to Alexander's period, and if he has written something, you can actually, you know, it is a lot more reliable. Right? Think of it. First of all, Megasthenes was not born in Greece. He was born in Central, uh, uh, actually he was born somewhere in Central Asia, Asia Minor region. He came along 50 years later. Second, his book Indica is not available today. What we know of 
as Alexander is supposedly through the only source, only major source is through Megasthenes and his work is not extant in any of the languages and we know of him through Pliny, Strabo, Arian and other historians who came 300 to 400 years later. This is a very important point and yet this is the sheet anchor. Again, what do we mean by sheet anchor? A sheet anchor is that particular you know, event which nobody questions. Okay, let's go back to it. Now, Buddha was born in 600 BC. How many of you believe Buddha was born in 6th century BC? None of us know history, so you can carry on. <laughs> no, we, we, I think we know the history that we were taught in schools, right? I mean, I was taught... Um, I, to I told you, yeah, okay. history is something we just uh, mug up and then warm it. All right. Marks, just marks. Okay. The, the, if you take today's history books, they parrot that, you know, Buddha was born in the 6th century BC. Right? How did we arrive at the 6th century? If you look at traditional sources, there are 24 sources. I would actually give this credit to Vedavira Arya. He is a, he's a, he's a historian. He has done a lot of work on the Puranas and the sculptures and, the, you know, and a lot of temple evidences. He has gone temple after temple. He has gone to all those inscriptions. He has studied them. And he has actually you know, correlated and said that there are 24 different dates for Buddha, of which 600 BCE is the lowest. Okay, and how did the Britishers arrive at the 6th century BC? They did two things. One is, okay, having identified, okay, so having identified Alexander, they wanted to do another skirmish, which is they wanted to assign Chandragupta Maurya as the counterpart of the, you know, Euro Greek history. There are two terms that we commonly come across in Greek history, which is Palibotra, which they said is Patna, and uh, Sandra Cortes, which they said is Chandragupta Maurya. Both are false. I don't want to go into it. There is a big theory behind it. The Puranic history actually takes the Mauryan Empire at least 1200 years back. I'll leave that aside. We'll come back for a different date. Let's go back to Buddha. So they said, you know, Chandragupta Maurya was born, you know, was an equivalent, was a counterpart of Alexander. So who, where should Ashoka be? Ashoka, they put another 150 years. And then, you know, there is a Tibetan text which actually says there is a 250 year difference between Ashoka's coronation and Buddha's death. So work backwards. And I'm not making up this is how our history is. Every other date has been correlated from this single instance. You mean to say 1,200 years of Indian history has been scrapped off? Has been scrapped. Okay. 1,200 years of Puranic history. By the way, I have to define what is Puranic history. Puranic history is the history that is b between the period of Mahabharata and the Gupta Empire. We have history before that. We have history coming from Manu. You know, if you look at it, the, our history actually starts from Manu. Manu has... Uh, Manu gave birth to Ila and Ikshvaku. Ikshvaku is Surya dynasty, which is where Ram belongs. And Ila dynasty is the Chandra dynasty, mm -hmm. which later on became the Pauravas or the Puru dynasty. And then they split into Yadava, which is where the Krishna dynasty is actually oh, coming in. That now, is you got a beautiful uh, history of Mahabharat, Mahabharat age. Did you get the point? So how, his, how Mahabharat is history is what he explained at the last... So it breaks into two dynasties. Wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have evidence. We have evidence linking the you know, Surya dynasty into Chandra dynasty. And people who participated in the Mahabharata war, have, our, our epicenter has shifted towards uh, Patna or Magadha. Okay? For 3,000 years, Magadhas are not Mauryas. You don't have one, uh, you know, you, don't, you just don't have one uh, dynasty. You had a total of nine dynasties ruling for about 3,000 years and uh, 109 kings. And all of this is in the Puranas. Right? Whether you believe it or not is a different issue. Right? But we have been told that none of this history is true. This is the true history of India and we have been trained and told that anything before 6th century BCE, just reject them as ahistorical. That's absolute gobbledygook. That's absolute nonsense. And what we are reading is, the, is, is nonsense. And this is the history, again, whether we arrive at it, whether the history book changes today or not is secondary. What is important for us is to be able to ask these questions. I just, want one, I just want to ask the historians who write this test book as to show me what is the primary evidence. And I can challenge you, none of them can show back any evidence beyond the British errors. Right? So, in fact, we made a petition to the Prime Minister asking that every textbook should have primary evidence to support a, you know, a, every chronology that they mention. It should have evidence to the best possible extent. And then alternative perspectives should come in. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. I know this is a very, I don't want to take, uh, you know, Srimati Vishaka Hari. So what he is uh, trying to say is, whatever has been rejected as ahistorical, 
அந்த பீரியட் தான் இந்தியா சூப்பர் பவர் ஸ்டேட்டஸ்ல இருந்த பீரியட் வாட் டஸ் ஹிஸ் ஸ்பீச் காட் டு டூ வித் இந்தியா சூப்பர் பவர் பாரத் ரீடிஸ்கவரி யூ மஸ்ட் பி ஒன்றிங் வாட் வாட் கரலேஷன் டஸ் ஹிஸ் ஸ்பீச் ஹாவ் வித் திஸ் டாபிக் எந்த பீரியட வைப் ஆஃப் பண்ணாலும் ஃப்ரம் அவர் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி which our period was wiped off from our history was the period when india was a super power status so that we don't know that our nation was a super power you know therinjadnaka then we will say okay india was such a great power, great super power and it is it was india who gave the whole world everything so we will start rebuilding that confidence in us we will start rebuilding the super power bharat ourselves so in order to stop us progressing this was what they have done 1200 years wipe off from the recorded history portion mentioning the gupta period as mauryan period as the gupta period so mauryan period and gupta period are confused because of the confusing name chandra gupta maurya gupta avum irukke maurya avum irukke and the pair la so gupta period ah maurya period ah நம்ம வரவும் வரவும் போறவும் எல்லாம் இவன் குப்தனா இருந்தா என்ன மௌரியனா இருந்தா என்ன நமக்கு நம்மளுடைய மென்டாலிட்டி இஸ் ஆல்வேஸ் தட் பட் ஃபார் தெம் திஸ் இஸ் அ கிரேட் ஹியூஜ் இஷ்யூ பிகாஸ் தே வைப் ஆஃப் இந்தியன் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி இஃப் யூ வைப் ஆஃப் இந்தியன் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி த சூப்பர் பவர் ஸ்டேட்டஸ் வில் கோ டு த வெஸ்டர்ன் நேஷன்ஸ் நவ் லெட்ஸ் வி ஹவ் ஓன்லி ஃபைவ் மோ மினிட்ஸ் ஸோ லெட்ஸ் டிஸ்கஸ் வாட் டு வி டூ ரைட் நவ் ஆஃப்டர் யுவர் டீன்ஸ் ஸ்பீச் யா moderate this session yeah, that sure. way i can ration the time accordingly giving everybody equal opportunity so if you have a question please uh, raise your hand uh, the mic will reach you and make it very brief yeah and the next person can also raise your hand so that the mic will reach faster so we'll have two questions there two so the question is regarding the vedic education system and the mekala education system okay So if you consider the vedic education system we have uh, padam kramam ganam mm. and based on that you need uh, at least 12 or 13 years to complete this and uh, regarding the mekala education system we are also taking almost uh, 12 to 15 years for uh, graduation mm. was there any evidence that this uh, concept was taken by mekala mm. to 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 structure the education system following the vedic principles or uh, examination system also for example we have kalvaita varam kind of examination like uh, you have to say 250 words or 300 words within th- this time you should not exceed uh, one word or below that so was there any evidence based on the research uh, any kind of influence on modern education system with respect you. to vedic uh, yeah mr narend yeah. is asking you, can, you. you can you can yeah i think i think that's a very Beautiful good question, question. yeah a beautiful question uh, so first of all what we mean by vedic education is not just ganam and kramam alone we actually try to say it's a much broader topic you know the shastras were actually included in what we claim as a vedic education the shastras were nothing but engineering let's uh, let's keep that perspective in mind but i'll come back to your question specifically so the single biggest contribution that uh, you know the system that they have appropriated mekala's education has appropriated is what is called as a student monitor concept and i'm not saying this i will refer you to two books one is uh, the a book called beautiful tree okay i re- i recommend anybody who's interested in india's education it's a book by a person called dharampal which is full of facts it's full of facts about how the british appropriated the indian system and i'll come back to the student monitor student monitor is nothing but they elect a particular person a boy as a student of that class and he himself can teach it a portion of the subject will be taught by him why is this important it is important because the number of institutions that were opened during the 18th century were astronomically high in fact i have done an analysis i put a graph in terms of the number of institutions that were opened by the british and they could not find enough teachers they could not find enough teachers to actually educate so they found the concept of student monitors very very interesting and uh, for, for in order to achieve scale you know they have used the they borrowed the idea from our gurukul system this question is 12 years of education 12 standard vericum padikrom did mekale borrow this concept of 12 standard vericum padikrom in the 12 years that is your question right 
So, that on the 12 years, okay, okay. in the 12 years, you know, correlate yeah. panna mudima. Why did he keep 12th standard? Why not nala avudu mudichale, konjama avudu vela kadache, inke college vandhu, konja oru breathing time nillama, 10th standard public board, 12th standard board. Okay, Why okay. that system? Okay, I, I think I misread the question. Syllabus. See, the syllabus evolved. I don't think, you know, we, we had a 12th standard system even in Mekale's time. The syllabus evolved over time. Yeah. You already had this yeah, right. school of education. So, uh, again, yeah, uh, exactly. So, 12th so standard, I don't know if he was the one who introduced it. So, number one, you know, when you come to the 17th standard, you can go to the portions, you can go to the portions. So, that is a uh, concept which evolved over time. But that is a good point raised by you because there are, of course, there are evidences which say around 30 to 32 years, Lada, the particular student finishes his education. There are, uh, uh, there are points raised by travelers who visited India, foreign vis travelers. They write that around the age of 30, students finish their education. So that could have been one of the points that Macaulay took into, uh, but uh, I don't think he had any systematized, in the Madhuri Pananda standard, I don't think he had it in mind. Yeah. Mm. 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 Okay. That's why many students don't get uh, settled even after 45 they are not uh, mar marrying nowadays. No, no, no. Jada hai, they are 55 na. So, Anjavarshat the Shashtit Burti and the marriage coincides. So, that, yeah. maybe that is. <laughs> I think there is also a difference of opinion in the birth time of Adi Shankaracharya. Adi Shankaracharya. Wonderful, by, yes. By history, it is Amma. given as 7th or 8th century, I think. Correct, correct, correct. But uh, I have read uh, an article by Varmacharya, but he claimed that uh, it is before 2000, 2500. Correct, correct, years. correct. If Kanchi Madatik Ponale, the Adi Shankaracharya life on the. Definitely, it's a BCE. Da. But they scrapped off history. Da. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Satish Prem. Just raise your hand no, so that they can see you. Okay. That's why he says, that's why Mr. Narendran says primary evidence. You get that chronology. So, Adi Shankara's birth time will be arrived from in the Pinnadi land Pono, from the existing Shankaracharya. You go lifetime calculate Panin Pono, it goes to BC, definitely. Very good just point, to, just to Just to add on to that, uh, there is also a Jain text. There is also a Jain text which supports the theory that Shankaracharya was born in 6th century BC. BC. Not just uh, Kanchi Mada's evidence. We have number of evidences, there are at least four or five evidence that supports the notion that Shankaracharya, Adi Shankara was born in 6th century BC. BCE and again, CE. We, yeah. we all have to unwind the unlearning that she talked about. You know, 1200 years of Puranic history, you have to bring it back. Now, if you do that, I think that some of the time frames will coincide. And people have started doing, you know, they have started what is called as triangulation. You know, if you find evidence in one, it has to match with evidence in another. And arche archaeological evidence will have to match with a linguistic evidence. And linguistic evidence will have to match with a genetic evidence and so on and so forth. So it's not going to be easy. We have lost it for 200, 300 years. It's easy to say using one mechanism, but it has to triangulate well with three or four postulations. And that's what is happening now. The new research in history is all about triangulation using new fields. Yeah. Um. Yes. Pranams to everyone. Uh, I am happy with the speakers that uh, I would like to thank you people because I teach history at School of Law Sastra over here. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and uh, I am happy okay. that you have created such a widespread interest in uh, non-social science background. So now audience. students won't sleep in your class, definitely. They don't all. They won't. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, ma'am, uh, we, and I am happy that you mentioned Dharampal's beautiful tree. It's already a part of Shastra's syllabus on oh, subaltern wow. studies. Under the auspices of uh, Gurumurthy sir, we have already incorporated Dharampal's works as well as Gayatri Spivak and Edward Sayath into our subaltern studies paper. Ma'am, you have mentioned, my students are extremely skeptical whenever I mention uh, fact from the Shastras. 
I mention Sri Vachana Bhushanam or I mm. mention something from Acharya Hridayam when I teach the Bhakti movement, they become skeptical. They say that, sir, you are teaching some mythological work, this is not fact, mm. this is fiction. Uh, I face the same problem that you just stated because I don't have, I only have oral traditions to substantiate my own conceptions of history or our indigenous versions of history. Ma'am, how do you think that we should cultivate this sense of genuinity or uh, to quell the, the skepticism that is in the mind of the students with regard to our vast array of uh, scholarly diaspora that has uh, managed to transcend history. Oh, wonderful, that's why I told you two things to say that the Puranas, Itihas and Vedas are not just fiction but facts. I told you, you can trace, Ipo, there is a recent research, Mahabharata, Yuddha, wherever Mahabharata took place, in the Himalayan region, Kurukshetra, Delhi, presently, all those places around uh, some 52 sites have been found out by a single girl, by a single girl, 52 sites matching Vyasa's Mahabharata, it remains in the same name. It remains in the same name. Kurukshetra, na, same name Kurukshetra. Where Drona taught, Gurgaon, Delhi, na, Guru or Gramam, where Drona taught, Guru Gramam. So 52 places have been matched. See, now in the fields of archaeology, astronomy, archaeoastronomy, marine archaeology, all these are supporting that these Ramayana, Mahabharata or whatever Shastras we have are not mythology but are history. Adukumela, if you are sceptical and you are not uh, um, convinced that uh, all this is just mythology and it's not, uh, it's not genuine, then you have primary evidence. And the, as he said, and the Kalatla Yar Erindalo, at the same time, contemporaries take those books and research. You, if you if you ask if you say all this like Karna Krishna and the Gaur Tanamale Sundi Varala Tukina this is just mag magic miracle this can this can be only mythology and it cannot be history then you can easily say uh, that another person from another religion walked on water but that they consider it as history they consider that period as common era the pere B C C E na vekara if that is history why not this if that is history why not this okay. That is the, I don't want to mention names, I don't want to make anything religious. See, everything is non-biased. It's not based on any religion. What I'm talking, what we are talking, we are not fighting for religion, we are fighting for Indians. So the first thing, India, if it should become a superpower, back to its superpower status, first let's feel Indian, be Indian. Forget that you are from a state, forget your vernacular language, forget your, uh, you forget your different culture. All of us are first Indians, forget your religion, forget your caste or creed. All of us are Indians. And the feeling that Indian history is the importance of the We are not fighting, as he said, it's not Hindu history or Muslim history or Christian history. This is Indian history. Don't segregate it is what he was trying to tell you. So let's work towards proper Indian history. If others are start, if others are questioning you during your history class, tell them this. There are so many evidences. Planetarium gold, Rama's birth, date of birth has been uh, found out scientifically, and there is an, even an English author. Uh, the best thing, Yarad Septikala na otuk mante. This is mythology and sonana. Use a foreign author. That particular Will Durant himself says Rama is a historical figure. That's it. That's a class over. Everybody will accept. I just want to add one little thing. This may be helpful for you. A lot of us believe uh, Babar, is, Babar lived, lived in flesh and blood. He wrote his autobiography, Babar Nama. But he has also claimed that when uh, Humayun was ill, he uh, went around his bed. It's there in his biography, autobiography. I've actually gone and checked it. And, uh, you know, suddenly uh, Humayun woke up and Babar uh, died. Fair enough. We have read this in history. See, history books have legends. Just because they have legends, you cannot say Baba did not live. You cannot say he was not the founder of Mughal. But it, you cannot prove this scientifically. How is that? How is it possible that a king can pray somebody and then the next moment his son will become alive and he will die? That's not true, right? So an element of legend is there in every text. Every text. Every text. In every text. 
But what she says is, yeah. let's be very, very factual about it. And these facts are coming up from interdisciplines. I can probably help you with some that of the material. That is triangular evidence. So triangular that, evidence. That yeah. triangulation, remember the same question. Triangular. You might also recall, last time also on a similar topic, we had uh, Sheldon Pollock's and, you know, Wendy Doninger's issue coming up. Now, there is this new book, uh, Rajiv Malhotra, he came and spoke also on the on this subject last year, The Battle for Sanskrit, where he has marshaled a new set of insight and research on how to tackle this type of, this new modern challenge that looks for some scientific empirical evidence for which there is a lot of information now that is available. One of the books is Battle for Sanskrit and definitely there is enough supportive evidence to challenge. After all, the current generation of students, I welcome that. But let's be prepared for an intellectual challenge based on scientific, uh, ex uh, you know, empirical evidence today viewed from Indian authors. And that's the real challenge is to get as much an Indian perspective instead of looking it through a Western Indologist scholar. The, yeah, we'll have two, two quick questions. Yeah. Yes, please. Hello. Hello. Ma'am, before yeah. I say, before I ask anything or say anything, I would like to say I'm a big fan and you're a big Actually, fan. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Please hold your mic closer. I've uh. uh, seen many of your things and uh, also that I like Indian history and actually I'm saying not the history as you told written by the British, not that one. I actually love the, our original Indian history. And also another thing is, uh, I was like to start, can I ask one thing, sir? Yeah, you're can supposed to ask waiting? a question. Yeah, you're supposed uh. to ask a question, <laughs> not oh, raise <laughs> Can I, talk, uh, can I talk in Tamil also? Please. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, actually, I first I wanted to know exactly what happened and everything. So, like, Mahabharata... In the book, that's the question. Ah, Mahabharata, no, ma'am. I doubt it, I don't think it's a cake. Ah, you don't think it's a cake, okay. No, ma'am. Mahabharata, Ramayana, I'm not going to learn all of them, I'm not going to learn all of them. So, I'm going to deep up, I'm going to learn all of them. You can learn all of them deep up, I'm going to learn all of them. From both points of views, okay. From Duryodhana and both, I'm going to learn all of them. And I'm going to learn all of them, I'm going to learn all of them. I don't like to say that these are questions, but these are just doubts that I like to ask. Prabhupada, when you say that, I think you have a question paper in hand. So, you better, just one question. Okay, sir. Uh, sir. If uh, it is a series of questions, you should have it offline. We'll have time for only one question. Choose okay, the sir. best from what you have. Okay, sir. First one. So, okay. Okay. ஆரம்பிச்சிருக்கேன் <laughs> So, what is the proof that we have also not edit our own, edit our own history to put ourselves in a good image? That number one, they have country a conquer panir klaan, angle pay raise down panir klaan. But number one, or another. There are exceptions, yeah, of course. Number one, they conquer pan Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia, na Raja Raja Indra Chola, Raja Raja Chola. There are exceptions that we have conquered. Na, yeh conquer panir land chala le. Number conquer panir kaam, but conquer pani yariyo aari che dil le. Conquer pani allariyo var vechir kaam. That is what I want to tell you. Yes, ma'am. Say the understood the question to support her uh, statement. No, he need not support me. He can ask me questions. Definitely, you no, can no. be against me also. No, no. The your statement, the study that the International Council, the Indian Council for Research in International Economic Relations, ICRIA, did a study and published a report in 2001 okay. to understand the civilizational propensity, how civilizations became powerful. And they found that of all the civilizations, it was an Indian civilization that without any military onslaught mm. was able to make a global footprint. That the biggest temple was in Cambodia, that a remote village in Vietnam still speaks Sanskrit, that the central university in Indonesia, which is called the Sandipani University, I don't know whether the secular polity today will allow a university in India to be named as Sandipani University, but in Indonesia it was allowed. So this information, that report clearly captures to drive home the point that without any military aggression, that India was able to conquer and establish global footprints through what she said, the cultural and the spiritual and other soft power. So there is a scientific Wonderful. report to make that statement good. good.
Good afternoon, ma'am, sir. Uh, I am a great supporter of your, uh, what you thought, uh, history, of this, his this type of history. I have two points in my mind. Uh, can I speak in Tamil? Yeah, sure, sure. Rendition, ma'am. One issue is that we have to revive the history of the total. Now, we have to revive the situation. For example, we have to go to the example of the Damascus Blade. We have to go to the research point. We have to go to the stainless process. Second type, there is a history, but we have to revive the history. For example, patent. We have to say the same research as the same research as the same research. What is it? They have to try 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 to try. Uh, side effects uh, on the par western medicine are there side effects irukku, but ayurvedic medicine side effect illama kandupidikka mudiyum but ana adukana patent or overall western companies vaangi vechirukanga so adanal inga research kuda panna mudiyadha nilamila irukranga so idha vande nama eppadi history ya future ku eduthu pogumbodhu eppadi idha kondu poradhu ma'am legal side la irukra history ya revive panna mudiyum maatengidhu already revive panna mudiyadha alinchu pona history yum revive panna mudiyala so what do we do in the future with the old history Wonderful. The revive Pandratakada in the session, in the our original true Indian history revive Pandratakada in the power talk. Veruma one Ramana lecture kaha illa. So sure, it's now up to you all, the youngsters, the student power to revive and now the global awareness in Gardha, it need not be only through textbook matto illa. Actually, global awareness WhatsApp la just irke. In the textbooks of it. So now it's your responsibility. So we need to do become a superpower. Spread the word across. So by spreading word to word, that is the biggest advertisement. Poster water, publish pantrudu, book adikar do illa. Word to word, that is the most powerful communication. So now it's up to you, Shastra students, to revive Indian history, youth power to bring history to true Indian history to the global front. Another uh, question was really good. Ipo namma teriyo ayurvedam ipo namlo dudha, but ella patentu Westerners mangi vechirkanga, Americans mangi vechirkanga. The thing is, namma ipo yedu ko Dutch talk na inno namma ke na lai iruko, adal lamu America ko, y Western ko patent panni unnu me illa the nationa pohu kura dengar dudha. This is the aim of today's Dutch. So, so that is a good question. We'll have Dr. Ram Kumar. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Mm. Ma'am, uh, you mentioned about uh, the GDP. Uh, 17th century, we had 24% and then drastically it reduced uh -huh. to 4%. Percentage. Is there any other reasons why, uh, apart from the exploitation of British, of Indian culture and Indian civilization, is there any other reasons which has really influenced that? In fact, which what I have read from, it, had, it mentions that uh, the discovery of New Land, America, and then the disruptive technologies, industrial te revolution happened in uh, Europe, as well as the Renaissance period, a lot of new technology, in fact, came up that time, including steel, motors, and all those things. Everything had an influence in deciding that GDP, I think. Is it all right to think in this direction? Absolutely. Wonderful. You answer. You answer. Yeah, that's a, I think that's an absolute, uh, absolutely Beautiful good question. question. Um, so I'll give you two responses. I think you talked about uh, the discovery of silver mines and gold mines in the Mexica, Mexican region. Now, what, is, what you have to understand is, if you trace the history, just before the discovery was announced, Britain actually switched over their currency and aligned it to the gold standard while they let, it, let our currency be uh, you know, valued against the silver currency. So the glut of silver mines that were exposed in the Mexican region actually brought our currency down by a significantly different uh, this thing. So the, the, the fact is we were still under the control of the British. We could not change our currency to align with this new discovery. So that played an influential role. The second aspect is a lot of people actually say that because industrial revolution started in Britain, India could have lost it anyway. Indian GDP could have fallen no matter what, whether British ruled us or not. My argument is as follows. Indians did not discover computers. Indians did not discover computers. Right? Yet, we have top global software companies operating out of India. Why is it? Because it is a diffusion of innovation that is more important than the discovery itself. Yes, you can discover it, but how are you adapting discovery? Now, it is here that the British actually played a big role. It is the control and those diffusions did not come here. The railways were not built for India. The railways were built to take, in, you know, to trade goods from the mainland to the ports. 
So none of the invasions that Britain brought into India was for the Indians. It was actually for the benefit of the Britons. And we could not buy ships. How many of you know, I don't know, uh, the biggest ships, some of the biggest ships were built by Indians, as Srimati Vishaka said. Yeah. The Star Spangled Banner, which is the American national anthem, was actually written on an Indian ship. The Treaty of Nanking, which is a secession of Hong Kong by China to uh, Britain, was actually on an Indian ship. Systematically, they decimated us. You know, the Great Bengal Famine, we read about opium war in China, and yet there was famine in Bengal because they moved away from cultivating rice, and they were made to actually cultivate opium. And that caused the first major famine in India. So the control of British, in my opinion, played an extremely big role. And it is, I don't think it is right to say that you know, India could have anyway gone, you know, uh, the economy could have fallen. That's, that's my view. And after the post 17th, 18th century, let me just conclude uh, with this statement uh, that the progress of a nation was shifted towards the economic wealth that it could create. And the very definition of what type of uh, 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 approach a nation takes, whether it is a socialist or a, a capitalist approach, uh, and that discourse kind of changed the way in which countries started planning. In fact, the example she quoted, Angus Madison study. The Angus Madison study was first commissioned by the OECD nations to disprove a previous study that Paul Bayrock, a Belgian economist, did. Actually, Paul Bayrock was asked to do a study because till such time, the developed nations believed that they had the natural propensity to add economic wealth and that economic progress after the 17th century was something natural for the Americans and some part of Europe. And they, didn't, they, they, they couldn't understand how Japan after World War, in a span of just four decades, was emerging as another economic superpower. So they wanted to understand Japan and that's why Paul Bayrock did this study. And, they, and he said, no, the uh, economic progress of America and some of the European nations was not natural. It was more an economic conquest or colonial uh, suppression of some of the nations. And to disprove that finding, they established the OECD study because Paul Bayrock did it only for two centuries, whereas the OECD study was, as she rightly said, starting from one, one common era, that brought the economic history of the world. That's when we realized that, oh, India and China were the top two economic nations. But since today the world respects power, and that is why everybody started looking at India after the Pokhran blast. So you had to be a nuclear power. Today, in the age of uh, globalization, today the world respects economic wealth. Now, since the discourse has changed towards how much economic wealth the country can create, we have all started looking at through the GDP. But one thing that can never change is that the civilization, the Indian civilization, has a natural set of civilizational assets that still makes our country a superpower in terms of any dimensions that she listed. And that is why everybody thinks that we have a great future because we have a greater past. So thank you very much, uh, Timothy Vishakahari, for your time. And thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Narendra, also for uh, adding support to this wonderful lecture. And I don't know how many of you noticed, but I noticed as the organizers for the event, she said, when talking about inventions, we should still have another Dutch Power Talk. So we will definitely fix you for the next year's 2018 Dutch Power Talk on the topic of uh, inventions. Uh, so I'm extremely happy for having accepted our invitation and be a part of uh, Dutch Power Talk this year as well. And uh, thank you all for being a patient and a wonderful audience. And thank you very much for your questions. So we'll take break now and we'll again reconvene at 2.45 when Dr. Bibek Debroy will be delivering a lecture on policy development for nation's development. So thank you very much. Thank you.